بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. Growing up, when I decided that I really wanted to become connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that I wanted to know Islam and practice Islam and live Islam, I wanted to be like Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu anhu and how he was so brave on the battlefield. I wanted to be like Bilal radiallahu anhu and not the adhan but to be able to recite the Quran in my own home with a loud proud voice. I wanted to be like Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu and how he was so knowledgeable about Quran and tafsir. And the more that I learned about these men companions whom were always presented in lectures and in khutbahs, the more I wanted to be like them. And my personality is a little more extroverted. And so I felt like I could try to be like them because I saw the actions that they focused on were about serving community. But then I was told that as a woman, I shouldn't really try to be like them, radiallahu anhum. I should really follow the example of the woman companions. And at that time, I didn't really connect to women companions. And the reason I had to sit with myself and really think about it, the reason was because I realized I didn't know them. The only space in which I had heard about them was just specifically talking about hijab mainly, the importance of being modest, of course. As a 16-year-old, hearing about Khadija radiallahu anha as the most incredible supportive wife, Aisha radiallahu anha as someone who was super modest and Fatima radiallahu anha as such a beautiful loving mother that was beautiful and that was awesome but I wasn't in those spaces at that time and it made it a lot harder for me to see myself in them and then I realized that I had been seeing the woman companions as passive bystanders in the prophetic community that I didn't know how they contributed, or how they spoke, or what they did, or how they reacted. I just didn't hear about them really ever. And so I started to study their lives. And subhanAllah, when I learned about the encompassing ways in which they understood modesty, the men and women companions, I realized that we as a community maybe sometimes need to take a step back and especially for our younger girls and boys growing up present the companions in a more comprehensive way so for example when we see someone like Asma bint Umais radiallahu anha one of the early converts of Islam with her husband Ja'far the son of Abu Talib radiallahu anhuma she was one of the first to make hijra to Abyssinia after Ja'far was martyred the wife of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhuma, Umm Rumman, the mother of Aisha radiallahu anha, she passed away soon after. And so then Abu Bakr and Asma bin Umais, both of them now widowed, they get married. And Asma becomes pregnant. And they go to make Hajj with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This one pilgrimage, this one opportunity to make Hajj. And she gives birth on the way to Hajj. When birth takes place, fiqh rulings take place. And they didn't know how they were supposed to continue on with Hajj. And so Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu didn't say I'm too shy to ask the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam what my wife should do in this situation. Asma radiallahu anha didn't say, I'm way too mortified to ask what I'm supposed to do in this situation. They had hayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their concept of modesty was the one who deserves the most modesty in front of is our Lord. And where does that begin except for in my personal practice with my Lord? And so Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he asked him what to do sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam just taught him how Asma continues and makes hajj and the fiqh rulings related to it. In that same hajj, 
Aisha radiallahu anha found herself in a situation that is specific to women and she began to cry. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught her the fiqh of what to do. But she narrated this narration to the rest of this ummah. Women until now know what to do in these circumstances because of Asma and Aisha radiallahu anhuma not saying it's too shameful and taboo to ask. And it's too shameful and taboo to share so that women know what to do. This comprehensive understanding of haya, of having this modesty with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is what we see with Fatima radiallahu anha as she was passing away. She was sick, and Asma bint Umais, who I just mentioned, the wife of Abu Bakr at this point radiallahu anhuma, she was caring for her, supporting her as she's very sick and in her last days. And Fatima radiallahu anha is thinking about when she passes, and she says that she doesn't like the fact that when the body is wrapped in a, in a burial shroud, that the shape of the body is a little more visible. So because Asma had been in Abyssinia, she had seen the way that the woman of Abyssinia would put the, the person who has passed in kind of like a coffin-like structure. So she suggested taking tw twigs and leaves and creating something like that. Fatima radiallahu anha asked to see it. Asma radiallahu anha had it made. When Fatima saw it, she asked to be placed in that. So from the janazah, she wasn't buried in it, but from the janazah to the burial spot, her body was covered from view so that the shape of her body was not shown. She's passing away, and her final concerns are about the shape of her body which is so powerful and speaks to the commitment that she had to hijab. But oftentimes when we talk about hijab in our community, it's almost obsessive that this is the only important aspect of a Muslim woman's worship. That when we see a sister with a little bit of hair showing, I have heard people make comments like, you might as well take it off. What's the point of hijab anyway? Even shaytan is confused. Why are you even Muslim? La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. I appreciate that some women had that uh, healing laugh after trauma right now. But I have met sisters who've taken off their hijab because of those statements. Many sisters. They said, you're right. What is the point? Fatima radiallahu anha's commitment to the way that she covered was not about what people thought. It was because she had a, con a comprehensive relationship with her Lord. And it was established through a relationship with her father, the Prophet The commandment of hijab came 14 years after the initial revelation, 13 to 14 years. I have met women who are about to convert to Islam and who are told, wait, 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 cover your hair first. As if the most important aspect before she even makes her shahada is hijab. Of course hijab is an obligation. Of course it's an honor. Of course covering in a comprehensive way is, an, is a beautiful, beautiful aspect. But when it's been beaten into you, when it's been made to seem like that's the only thing that matters in your relationship, it impacts the way that you feel about it. And yet the woman companions, when the verses of hijab were revealed, there's a narration of Hafsa who narrates that a woman came to the Prophet and she talked about how she serves in the battlefield. She helps take care of the wounded, she nurses the sick, and she helps take care of the dead, taking their bodies. She said, I don't have the material to cover myself in, the, in covering my hair and my body. I don't have the financial means to have this outfit. The Prophet وسلم, just taught her to borrow an outfit. He didn't say وسلم, it's better for you not to be present. He said borrow an outfit. This Hafsa narrated to Umm Atiyah about this incident. Umm Atiyah is Nusayba. She's known as Nusayba, Nasiba, Umm Ammara, Umm Atiyah. She was the warrior who defended the Prophet ﷺ in Uhud. Everywhere he looked left and right, she was there. 
She battled seven battles. In one of those battles, she lost her arm. So she became a woman with a disability because companions with disabilities were critical for the community of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as they are critical for our community today. So she, Hafsa, is narrating this to this woman warrior of the companions, and there were many. Over 30 women battled in the battles amongst the companions, and then others helped with nursing the wounded and caring for those who'd passed. And when she narrates this, Um Atiyah then says that she asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they're having a conversation about hijab. Um Atiyah then says that we used to keep our younger girls, I'm very cautious with the words because this is a family event, so they used to keep some of their younger girls at home. And the Prophet Sallallahu ordered that even those women in a particular state should come to the Eid Salah. And when he was asked, what if she doesn't have something to cover herself with? The Prophet Sallallahu didn't say, oh yeah, in that case she should just stay home. No, the Prophet Sallallahu said, let her borrow something. O Kamaqal Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why? So she will be present to witness the good. Asma bint Umais, who I mentioned earlier, who was nursing the Fatima radiallahu anha as she was passing away. She also was one of the women amongst two with Ali radiallahu anhum who washed Fatima's body radiallahu anha. And then Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu became sick. He became sick and she cared for him in his final days. And despite the fact that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu had multiple children, he put it in his will that he wanted Asma radiallahu anha to wash his body. So Asma bint Umais washed Fatima radiallahu anha and she washed Abu Bakr radiallahu anha before they were buried. And yet I've heard so many times, specifically when it comes to women in the space of this very huge loss, that women are too emotional to be able to handle it. A woman could be a fitna if she's in that space. We have, we have Asma radiallahu anha who washed the best of the best of the companions radiallahu anhum. Oftentimes when we talk about modesty, we focus just on dress. But their understanding of modesty was about commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all actions, including dress, but in all actions. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught them to be balanced in this interaction. And they, he taught him, so they, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught them, he taught them responsibility. So that when in those 14, 13, 14 years before hijab was revealed, they were learning about the hereafter. They were learning about maintaining iman. They were learning about their own accountability in the akhirah. It impacted their hearts. One time I was in a masjid. We have a local masjid in California where I live where there is no wall between men and women. We have several masajid and this is the only one that doesn't have separate rooms. And so the imam was speaking, it was Ramadan, and he said, Brothers and sisters, as you know, we don't have a wall in this masjid, we're all in the same room. And so the way that you dress is very, very important. Modesty is very, very important. Brothers, please dress more modestly in the masjid. And I was expecting you to laugh because we never hear that. We quite literally never hear that. As women, maybe men hear it sometimes. But women don't hear it addressed to men. But the Prophet وسلم, he brought community together. He taught the men and women are partners, twin halves of one another. The Quran talks about men and women as allies of one another. We are allies to one another. We build this community together. Haya, having this modesty with one another looks like being professional and respectful in our interactions. It looks like uplifting one another, being allies to one another. And of course, it also looks like dressing modestly too. But it does not look like shaming and blaming women. Because when the Prophet وسلم, had a beautiful woman come to him and ask him a question, he was riding with his cousin behind him, Al Fadl. And this companion, who's a woman, comes, anha, and Al Fadl is staring at her. He's like, mashallah, just staring at her. And the Prophet ﷺ, this is in Hajj, 
So she's, her, her face is uncovered and he's seeing her. The Prophet وسلم, didn't say to her, please leave and ask a man to come and ask your question instead. In fact, she was asking a question on behalf of her father. The Prophet وسلم, didn't tell her, you should not be here. The Prophet وسلم, didn't blame her for Al Fadl looking at her. He didn't make her feel disgusted for existing. Instead, وسلم, he made the place where she could ask comfortable, respectful, a safe space. He turned Al Fadl's face like this. <laughs> he also didn't shame Al Fadl. He didn't blame Al Fadl. He didn't make him feel like the worst human being to ever exist because he just had a moment. He taught him personal responsibility. In another narration by Ibn Abbas in Musnad Imam Ahmad, there was a beautiful woman of the companions who would pray in the front row of the women's lines. And a group of the men companions, kind of like the shabab of the companions, they knew she would pray in the front line, so they would go pray in the back of the masjid. And then in salah, in ruku'ah, they would look under their arm. In ruku'ah, they would look under their arm at her. The Prophet ﷺ did not then create a, a wall in his masjid. The Prophet ﷺ did not then say, woman, you should not be coming to the masjid anymore. The Prophet ﷺ did not ban this woman from coming to the masjid. Many of us have maybe experienced those types of policies in some of our communities. Certainly not all, but some of our communities. When we have policies that put the full brunt of responsibility on women, I'd like to share with you some of the messages that I've received. Women who've told me that they used to love going to the masjid until they were no longer allowed to go into the men's section. And that now, when they go into the women's section, and it's filled with sleeping bags from the men, and it's filled with shoes, and it smells, and there's no toilet paper in the bathroom, that they just don't want to go. Again, some masajid, not, not all, but this isn't a shocking case. I'd like you to nod your heads if you've heard of cases like this before. That is so many people. This should be a shocking case. This shouldn't be, oh yeah, there are many masjids like that. I've heard from women who used to go memorize the Quran with their brothers. As children, they loved to memorize Quran. Some of our children love to memorize Quran. May Allah bless them and keep them firm in Quran. Amen. And they would go with excitement until they reached about 12 or 13. And then the imam told her parents that he can't teach her anymore because she's getting older. That imam is the only imam of the masjid. The only one teaching Qur'an. So what do you think happened to her Qur'an as her brothers finished their memorization? She didn't continue. And this particular sister told me that it's been 20 years since she's opened the Qur'an. It wasn't until she heard about Qari'a, the Woman Qur'an Reciters app, which is free, Q-A-R-I-H, Qari'a, Woman Qur'an Reciters from all over the world in different qira'ats of the Qur'an. It's for women, women's recitations. You can download it on Google Play Apple stores. Until she heard about Qari'a, she didn't know that women could even be in the Qur'an space because of her experience. After 20 years, she opened the Mus'haf. Right now, I'm hearing from women who are telling me that their 5-year-olds and their 12-year-olds and their 15-year-olds are saying that they want to be a Qariya. Last year, they didn't know what that term meant. Qariya is a woman Qur'an reciter. We can encourage women to recite the Qur'an for women. We can have conferences of women Qur'an reciters for women. We can have little girls going up stage and having the experience of reciting the Qur'an for other women. That is where the understanding of modesty comes from. Why? Because when we have a relationship with the Qur'an, with the revelation that was established for 13 to 14 years before hijab was even addressed, we have hearts that are ready to soak in the revelation. And that's not to say that sisters who don't wear hijab don't soak in the revelation, not at all. 
But if we don't want to look at particular individuals and rather look at a community overall, we need to shift the way that we talk about women's issues in general. Let's look at the root cause. How many times can we expect women in particular to carry all of da'wah on our shoulders, to deal with Islamophobia, to constantly be judged? And then that same sister doesn't know if there's a woman scholar to ask questions when she has very intimate questions that only a woman completely understands about her cycle. Where do we expect women to go when someone is yelling at her and making her feel like she should not be in the United States simply because of the way that she's dressed? And then she tries to come into the masjid space and she also doesn't feel welcome. How is she even supposed to know that the men scholars of our history were taught by women, that Ibn Taymiyyah, the Ibn Hajar, the Imam al dhahabi that all of the greatest scholars of our time had women teachers. Fatima al-Khair was a great scholar in the time of Imam al dhahabi and al subki And it's narrated, Ibn Rush narrates, that she would sit where the Prophet Wasallam's grave is. You know the barrier between the grave and the masjid? There's a barrier. She would lean back and she would teach hadith. And the men would sit and the women would sit and they would learn from her in the masjid of the Prophet And then when they were learning from her, she would give them ijazah written by her hand. Zainab bint Mekhi. She was the teacher of Ibn Taymiyyah. May Allah have mercy on both of them. This understanding of women in these spaces of scholarship, in these spaces of Qur'an, in these spaces of passing on our tradition, is a reflection of modesty. Because we are so shy as a community in front of Allah, that when we are going to be asked by Him on the Day of Judgment about the way that we lived, about the girls who were under our care, about the little boys who were raised not seeing women in spaces that they could have been in, to learn that these are their sisters to be, to, be, uh, to be allies with. What are we going to say about three generations into the future if the sisters today don't necessarily feel connected and then they raise children who don't necessarily feel connected and they raise children who don't necessarily feel connected? Where does that go back to? How shy are we going to feel in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if we don't address the greater fitna of women leaving the community and being afraid to come back. We have in the prophetic society companions who were praised for their modesty, like Arthman, radiallahu anhu. The Prophet wasallam taught that the most modest companion of his ummah was Uthman, radiallahu anhu. The Prophet wasallam one day was lying down and his thigh was showing. Abu Bakr came in, he didn't move, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Umar came in, he didn't move, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uthman came in and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam up and covered his thigh. When Aisha radiallahu anha asked about it later, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, shouldn't I be shy? Shouldn't I have this modesty in front of the one that the angels have this modesty in front of? Imam al nawawi mentions that it is, it is a sifa, it is a description of the angels that they have this type of modesty. And the angels are ordered to do nothing except what Allah orders them to do. And there is an ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem, rahman rahim He talks about, الَّذِينَ يَحْمِلُونَ الْعَرْشِ وَمَنْ حَوْلَهُ يُسَبِّحُونَ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّهِمْ وَيُؤْمِنُونَ بِهِ وَيَسْتَغْفِرُونَ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا رَبَّنَا وَسِعْتَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ رَحْمَةً وَعِلْمًا فَاغْفِرْ لِلَّذِينَ there are a group of angels who do nothing but believe in Allah. Why, do they, why does Allah sometimes say believe in Allah? Of course they believe in Allah. They're angels they're holding up his throne, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Sha'arawi, he mentions that you believe you're seeing me right now. You're seeing me, you're giving me a lecture. I'm giving, excuse, you're, we're in the lecture together. You're seeing me. But this here means the angels don't know the future. So these angels, they are praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they yusabbihun. This is in Arabic a constant verb. It's happening constantly, right now. And what are they doing? They are asking for forgiveness for the believers. They are praying for the believers. They are making dua for the believers. This sifa, this concept of modesty that the angels have, 
These are the angels who are making dua for me and you every single second because Allah ordered them to. And who are lilladina amanu? Lilladina amanu is not somebody who believes and they worship and they do nothing but worship 24-7. That would be mu'mineen. Amanu are the people who have believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but sometimes they struggle to show that belief in their actions. Allah is so loving and merciful that no matter how you dress, or no matter how you struggle with your relationship with Him, He has ordered angels to make dua for you. That's how much He loves you. And the Prophet ﷺ taught us that the mujahid is the one who strives against his or her own self in the obedience of Allah. And Ibn Hajar, in explaining this hadith mentioned, I'm going to use the phrase spiritual warrior, that the spiritual warrior is the one who even though they hate it, they do it. Even if they really badly want to do it, they don't do it because Allah ordered that. That doesn't make you a hypocrite. That makes you a spiritual warrior. It's an honor to be in a room with spiritual warriors. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us with the people that he loves. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us with the people of the Quran. And please download Qariya right now, it's free. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik nashanu wa da'i laha ila'at nistaghfirkim wa natubu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.